we've talked about soft skills and we've gotten started on soft skills. We thought it would be a good idea to have somebody who actually knows the details and the research background about soft skills. Um, so it great, gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Steve Laybourne, my friend and colleague here at Boston University. Uh, Steve teaches and researches in innovation, change, and improvisation. Steve learned his improvisation skills following rock bands around England in the early 1970s. <laughs> is a he's right. Is a background in organizational theory and behavioral theory, uh, which explains his interest in soft skills. Um, in fact, Steve is something of an international authority on improvisation. Um, Steve also pioneered team teaching online. Um, and if you talk to people, they say, yeah, we do teams online. Um, and that means they put people into a group and hope that teaming will happen. <laughs> Steve actually has a solid research-based foundation to his teaming online. Um, he's a real pioneer in that. and so. Um, feel free to grab him at lunch and talk to him about that. What you probably don't know about Steve is after leaving school, he became a banker. And then uh, he decided one day that he'd had enough banking, and he went back to school, and he got a PhD from Cardiff University. He was teaching at Plymouth University um, when we managed to steal him away and signed him as a free agent. So that's why he's working with us. So we've asked Steve to give us a quick overview on the theory and vocabulary behind soft skills. So, Steve Laybourne. Okay, by the way, that was Plymouth University in the UK, not Plymouth on the South Shore. Um, <clears throat> oh, um, has anybody lost an earring? All women check, because this was found on the floor earlier. <laughs> If, if it's yours, then it's here. Uh, right, okay, sorry. Um, so I'm the first person up here today um, who's not wearing a suit, um, or a tie for that matter. Um, as Roger said, I spent 25 years in banking, and when I left banking, I, I vowed never to wear a suit and tie again unless I absolutely had to, and I now wear a suit and tie once a year, and by the way, it's tomorrow because tomorrow's graduation and I feel that the students deserve it. Other than that, you know, this is about as smart as I get. Anyway, that's by the by. Um, okay, so, we wanna, we're talking today about competencies, okay? And I thought we, you know, like all good academics, we'd start with a definition. And this is the US government's definition, by the way, of competencies. Uh, the measurable or observable knowledge, skills, abilities, and behaviors critical to successful job performance. And they suggest that there are three types of, of competencies, and I'll talk much more about, well, not much more, but we'll talk about this later. Knowledge competencies, skill and ability competencies, and behavioral competencies. And the combination of these three things is really what people need to be successful in their jobs. That's certainly the way that, uh, that, that this is seen by the US government. So what PMI did, oops, and it's, it's actually in this document, the Project Manager Competency Development Framework, which was published over a decade ago now, is PMI basically lifted this and changed it around a little to suit themselves to fit with project management. So the PM competency framework is based on the understanding that the US government have about competency. And as I said, we talk about three separate dimensions, okay? We talk about knowledge. So in this case, it's about what a project manager knows about the application of processes, tools, and techniques, project activities, etc. There's then the performance element, performance or ability element, which is really about how a project manager applies the knowledge that they have to meet project requirements. <clears throat> and the third thing is about behavior, about how a project manager behaves when they're actually performing these activities in a, um, in a project environment. So, and in order to be recognized as competent, you need all three, 
Okay? And Ro Roger and I have been talking about this over the last couple of days. And there was some talk earlier on about vocabulary, about the fact that you need the knowledge, you need the vocabulary so that you, you can actually talk about what happens within projects. The vocabulary comes at the knowledge level. So the argument is you need the knowledge first, then you learn how to perform using your personal behaviors to, to do that as effectively as possible. So we've talked about hard skills a bit, the vocabulary, the, and stuff like scheduling, work breakdown, formalized progress tracking, earned value, risk identification, the stuff that's in the project management body of knowledge essentially, which I think runs to 640 odd pages now. It's quite a majestic document. Um, but actually, the project management body of knowledge doesn't really touch on soft skills at all, um, or not much. I mean, it, it does a bit. It started to move that way, but it's only scratching the surface. Um, so what about soft skills? Can we define them? Well, I picked this def definition up off the internet. I have no idea who, who wrote this, but soft skills are personal attributes that enhance an individual's interactions, job performance, and career prospects. Unlike hard skills, which are about a person's skill set and ability to perform a certain type of task or activity, soft skills are interpersonal and are broadly applicable. In other words, if you are good at motivating people, at, at, at getting people committed, at building trust, stuff like that, you can take that anywhere and it will still work. So whereas the harder skills, the technical skills of project management are very much domain specific, you know, you need different skills to be, you know, um, a project manager in oil and gas construction than you do in IT project management or behavioral change or, or, or whatever. Um, the soft skills are much more transferable. So, um, but there's no real magic involved in this. We just need to develop soft skills competencies. Um, and when we talk about soft skills competencies, you know, we go back to you know, we know what the hard skills are, um, but do we know what the soft skills are? Um, does anybody have any views about the sort of things that we talk about when we're talking about soft skills? Anybody want to shout a couple out? Interpersonal skills. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, to repeat, uh, interpersonal skills, the ability to... Um, motivate, to persuade, uh, to get others to go in a common direction. Okay. Um, you're absolutely right. And I mean, I always say that you can have the best Gantt chart in the world, you can have the best work breakdown structure in the world, and you need those things because they force you to think through the issues and to plan. But a Gantt chart never delivered anything. A work breakdown structure ne never delivered anything. A risk plan never delivered anything. It's people carrying out tasks and activities within the, the project that deliver. And as the project manager, it's up to you to persuade them to do that or to encourage them to do that or to build the commitment so that they want to do that, to trust them to do it properly, etc. So I've identified a couple, a few, what I consider to be valuable soft skills for the project management. Motivation. You have to be able to get people to do stuff for you. And that means motivating them and giving them a reason to want to achieve. Commitment, getting people committed to what they're doing so that you know, they want it to be a success. Basic commitment theory says if you involve people in decision making, they'll have a much greater you know, understanding and a much greater desire to make sure that what's delivered is what they, they bought into. Trust. Building trust. And trust is important because the project manager doesn't want to do everything themselves and doesn't want to micromanage. So you need to be able to build in your team a level of trust so that you can tr trust those people to go off and do what you need them to do without you looking over their shoulder all the time, without you micromanaging. Creativity. Now, I'm starting to sort of shift towards the improvisational thing now because um, a lot of project managers say that the last thing I want is my project teams to be creative. I want them to do what's on the plan. Uh, but actually, 
you know, things change in, in projects. I, can't, I don't know of a project that's ever delivered exactly what it intended to deliver at, you know, at the inception stage. Things change as we go through projects, external uh, issues arise, etc. cetera. And, and sometimes you have to be a little creative to, to get around that. Intuition. I'm a great believer in intuition. I think intuition is incredibly powerful. There are lots and lots of, uh, of reasons why we should trust our intuition because it is actually a very powerful thing. But I don't really have to. I mean, I could do an hour on intuition alone and, and Roger's already looking at me and saying, you know, um, <laughs> don't take too long over this. Uh, but intuition is incredibly powerful and, and trusting your intuition, your intuitive gut feel for what will work in a particular situation is actually very powerful. And the last one that I've identified for now is empathy. Empathizing with your team. Seeing things from the perspective that they're seeing them so that you can understand how they are engaging with the issues that you're trying to... Um, you know, to get them to engage with. So empathy is, is really important. Oops. And I see a shift away from process and towards behaviours in the project management literature particularly. I mean, if you go to project management research conferences, 10 years ago, 75% of the papers were about tools and techniques and... and, and, and <laughs> A, a, a earned value and, and, and risk and stuff like that. Nowadays, 75% of the papers seem to be about how to get people to deliver for you in the project. So th there is a shift. Um, and working out what makes people deliver, which involves these links with motivation, commitment, trust, etc., you know, is, is becoming really important for the project manager. And it links with something that those academics in the room call the social construction of reality. The social construction of reality basically means that we all see things slightly differently based on um, our values, our norms, our knowledge base, our culture, our organizational expectations, etc. And empathy is about actually getting into a place where you can see how other people see things so that you can understand the problems and the issues they have. You know, we all have our own version of something that um, that we need to achieve, you know, I might look at something and say, "I have no idea how to do that," so it's a real problem. But somebody else on on my team or in the room might say, "Well, actually, that's easy because I've done it before. Uh, I have a different knowledge base to you, so I therefore have the way to achieve this." You know, um, I have the experience, etc. So. We have to understand that people see things differently. We don't all see things the same way. And the social construct, you know, and we all socially construct our own versions of reality around what we're doing. And, and I think that's really important for project managers. And going back to the skills, the soft skills, um, a guy called Charles Handy, who's an English academic uh, and consultant, uh, management consultant, who actually wrote a book that persuaded me to become an academic. Um, really fascinating guy. But he talked about a personal portfolio of transferable skills that you could take from job to job. And soft skills are essentially transferable. You know, they are your toolkit that you can take from place to place. So soft skills are really important. And of course, this all feeds into leadership. And leadership is, you know, is important because we use soft skills to persuade, to cajole, to encourage, to communicate, to convince, um, and to get people to deliver for us. And, you know, at the end of the day, delivery is what project managers do. Delivery is really important because as project managers, we're judged on what we deliver and indeed how we deliver it, whether we deliver it on time, whether we deliver it within budget, etc. But we're judged on delivery, and project managers have to deliver. Um, but delivery is achieved by people. You know, it's people who carry out tasks and activities, um, but people are interesting. And there are all sorts of unforeseen issues around people, you know, things that we don't 
that we don't think are going to happen that that suddenly do. Like our key, the key guy who's delivering a particular part of this project, you know, gets run over by a truck. Or okay, I'll, we sorry, we do hope he doesn't get run over by a truck. But you know, breaks his leg and ends up in hospital for a bit. You know. We have to be flexible in projects because things happen. The classic thing, of course, is as a project manager, you go to a line manager and say, I'm going to need your guy for, um, you know, for 10 hours a week for the next, th uh, for three weeks in June. And, and is that going to be okay? Yeah, that'll be fine. So you go at the end of May and you say, don't forget, next week I'm going to want Joe for 10 hours a week. Ah, well, I've got Joe doing something else now. You know, would you take Mary instead? You don't really want Mary because Joe, you've worked with Joe before and, you know, Joe's the guy that you trust and that, so things happen. Requirements change. And, you know, that means that we have to think about new ways of doing things and 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 i'm just going to touch very quickly on improvisation here uh new skills required by the project manager creativity intuition i've talked about both of those already adaptation using the stuff that's been successful for you before and and adapting it to different situations innovation different novel ways of thinking about how to resolve things and the application of prior learning which i think is really important reusing the good stuff that worked in the past and avoiding the stuff that didn't. And that means you have to understand what worked and what didn't and do the analysis. And project managers sometimes are not very good at that. So these are all skills that link with organizational improvisation, which I could talk about for an hour or two, but I'm not allowed to. So we're talking about, you know, the manager, the project manager, almost as a superman, you know, or maybe as a superwoman, you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's an interesting area. So I want to open this up to the audience now. And I want to talk a little bit about knowledge, performance, and the personal stuff that we have going on that, that influences how we do things. So let's talk about knowledge first. Anybody have any views about knowledge base? Um, Alice can c come up and, because I'm going to ask you some questions. Come up, Alice. Um, Have you noticed I just do whatever they tell me? <laughs> okay, so if we talk about, you know, knowledge, performance, and the personal attributes, then, you know, we need to think about knowledge first, because if we think that knowledge is the, the, is the, the first part of the chain, if you like, I mean, how do we acquire knowledge? Um, and maybe you want to start this off, Alice. You know, how do you how do you um, build the knowledge base of the project managers who work for the city of Boston? So, are you talking about soft skills or hard skills? Well, both. But <laughs> certainly, I mean, I, I'd be more interested in the soft skills because I think that they're more challenging. They're definitely more challenging, and uh, where we do try to provide sort of the, the one day workshops of writing, uh, communication, uh, team building. It's really something that I think part of it is your personality. <laughs> you know, you have to have a certain personality to, to be a project manager. You have to be very patient. You have to be understanding. You have to be a person that can get along with a number of different kinds of personalities. And if that's not you, then you're probably not going to be a really good person, uh, project manager. So that knowledge is really the experience and working in those um, situations that you learn how to do these things. OK. Um, does anybody have any views about building a knowledge base, and particularly a knowledge base in, sefs, um, in soft skills? Hello, my name is Fred. Um, as far as knowledge is, I believe there are certain things you can learn from school or from books. It's more learning from experience, your interaction with people, your family, your kids, your brothers and sisters. So uh, the soft skills you learn from these aspects can also go a long way in helping you, you know, to develop yourself in the business aspect as well. So it's not just about education, it's not just about reading books, but personal interaction with people, your family, and thank you. Okay. 
Anyone else? There's somebody at the back here. So, in terms of soft skills for knowledge, um, I would say that it kind of ties into the behavioral aspect. And from a school perspective, I think that it's very important that there is potentially a class that points out things for you to consider and takes you out of your normal frame of mind of what you think and points out ways to um, identify what other people might be thinking or how you can get them to respond to what you want them to do. Um, but from a on-the-job perspective, I think it comes a lot down to the mentoring aspect and you kind of tie in the whole management um, and leadership skills into that when you're working with someone who has a knowledge gap in terms of how to work with people from the soft skills perspective. OK, thanks. So um, if I can I think just that respond to I'm that. Sorry, go on. So that's really interesting to, in terms of talking about the education piece and the soft skills. And this is a conversation actually was having with Roger yesterday um, in terms of the, the, the courses that you can take for the certification. And my recommendation is a lot more role playing and having the teams role play and then getting that feedback in terms of was that a successful encounter and what, how can it be better? Because I, as, I, as you mentioned before, you know, some of the things you're not going to learn in a book, you're going to have to experience. And that's really where I'm coming from. Oops. Because I actually did take a class because I had a very big issue with being an introvert and didn't know how to work with people. But I wanted to be successful at being a project manager. And that one class, probably 12 weeks long in my undergrad, totally changed my perspective on how to work with people and it really pointed out those pieces that I was missing because I was always very good ob at observing and understanding body language but I wasn't understanding on how to communicate that information. So that's really actually where it comes from. Thank you. Okay. I mean, I have my own ideas about this. I mean, you know, we can learn knowledge. Uh, some, of, some knowledge is easier to, to acquire than others, obviously. Um, and let's face it, it's what you're doing now. You know, you're acquiring knowledge from sitting in this room. Um, but, you know, we get knowledge from books, from seminars, from webinars, from study, from earning qualifications like PMP. I mean, you know, it's what we at Boston University and every other university in the world are actually about. We're about trying to transfer knowledge to know our client base if you like our students um, but people have made the very valuable sort of point that knowledge is also gained through doing so ex experiential learning is really important and most of us actually learn the you know the cooler stuff through experience and once you have knowledge then you have to perform in the execution of your duties using that knowledge. So, um, you know, what we're talking about here is the application of learning and knowledge. And I think that, um, you know, that's a really interesting area. We've already touched on the fact that um, for project managers, at least, uh, you know, some knowledge is domain, is domain sp uh, specific. You know, the, you need a different set of skills to be a construction project manager, to being an IT project manager, to being, um, you know, a behavioral change project manager, to being, a, you know, somebody who builds oil and gas pipelines, you know, whatever. Um, some of the, the knowledge is overlapping. And actually, the soft skills stuff overlaps more than the, uh, uh, than the hard skills and technical skills stuff. Um, so... Experience is important here, but people do move from you know one in you know one industry domain to another. They they they'll take some technical skills with them, but they'll take all their behavioural stuff, and uh, and and I think that you know that's that's a really critical thing. The fact that you know you have this bag of tricks that that I talked about that Charles Handy talked about the the this personal portfolio of skills, and you can apply that anywhere. Um, and that's the real strength of soft skills, I think. Um, and then the last bit is about the personal stuff, about how you behave in the role. And 
it could be argued that you build the knowledge, you then learn to apply that knowledge, but you apply it in different ways depending on the way you interact with the people that you're working with. And the, the personal behavioral stuff, you know, you know, our own particular beliefs, norms, you know, based on upbringing, um, education, culture, personal knowledge base, etc. You know, um, that is, that, that, uh, that, uh, you know, that is really important. Um, and that empathy with and respect for others that we're working with, um, you know, I just think that that's a huge issue. Um, we do some stuff about emotional intelligence in, in, in my part of the, uh, um, of the BU program. Um, but I just think that it's how you do it and how you build, and that comes down to how you're perceived, you know, uh, um, as well. Anybody have any views about that? Yeah, okay. Well, I just wanted to add, hi, uh, Jack Polner, IT Services Manager for uh, Newton Public Schools, which is K-12, and I'm also part-time faculty here at BU for the online program. Um, I was thinking about how do you acquire knowledge? And I think when we talk about experience, we talk about making mistakes and we think about is it okay to make mistakes and is it okay to fail and let ourselves do that. I mean, that's how we acquire knowledge. We're not afraid to fail. Um, and when I was thinking about hard skills, well, if you're developing a program, you're going to write it and it's going to have bugs and you shouldn't be afraid to try it out and you know it's going to perhaps fail and you know, you'll test it and make it work. But what about soft skills and working with people and not being afraid to fail, um, but how do you deal with hurting their feelings and damaging trust? Because anytime you fail with people, that's what may happen. So how do you sort of work in that environment where you can still go on but not be afraid to fail in soft skills. So I that's, think that's my question. that's a really interesting question. And uh, uh, to some extent, it comes down to the culture of the organization that you're working with it. Because um, organizational culture that uh, tolerates failure, um, because not everything is going to work. I mean, the thing with academics is we say that <laughs> learning is learning. And learning what doesn't work is, is just as important as learning what works. But actually, managers don't see it like that. They just want to know what works. They don't want to know what doesn't work, and they don't want you to, um, you know, to spend your time finding out what doesn't work. They want you to find out, you, know, you, you to spend your time finding out what works and generates profit and 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 success for the organisation. Um, but organisational culture is particularly important. Um, if you have a culture where failure is criticised, um, highlighted. And, and generally, you know, not accepted, then people are not going to try new things. They're not going to poke their head above the parapet and they're not going to, to experiment because they know that if they get it wrong, they're going to be persecuted or, uh, you know, or, or, or made an example of. Um, if you work in an organization where there's an understanding that not everything works and you go, okay, well, you know, that didn't work, but we learned something from it and next time we'll be able to, to feed that information into in, in, into what we do, then fine, you know. Alice, do you have a view on that? That is a great question. <laughs> and I'm sitting here, I'm standing here sort of struggling with it. And what comes to mind is this line right here, empathy with and respect for others. And I think that as long as you're having that value, you're, you're treating people that way, there's nothing wrong with going back later saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I, it, it, what I said to you was incorrect or I didn't do it right. But you're going to find that's less if you always are re really dealing with people with respect and empathy. I think also, uh, Steve, buried in your comment, uh, or your response to this, was the fact that in part of organizational culture, too, uh, I think facets go hand in hand. There's the tolerance of failure and the lack of innovation. Because if you want to innovate, you have to take the risk of failure. You must take it. And if your company doesn't tolerate failure well, you will also know that they're not going to accept new ideas very well either. And that's really a challenge, I think, in, you know, for not just in a company, but in our society in general. Because for us to move forward in any 
sustained, systematic, positive way, we have to innovate. And that, by definition, will require some uh, moxie, uh, some stamina, and some tolerance of a lot of risk and failure. I absolutely agree. And um, one of the issues with companies as they grow is, is they wrap process around what they're doing. They, they base what they want to do in the future on a historical understanding of what's worked well for them in the, fa um, in the past. They have a large customer base that they don't want to lose. They have revenue streams that they need to protect. And actually innovating you know, goes against all of that and it's a real problem for organizations. I'm sorry, you had a question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Andrea and I'm a, I'm a study here at BU in project management. And I think uh, one of the more important things is to focus on emotional intelligence. Because I already have the background. I have the knowledge. I'm an engineer. I have a, like plan, control, and quality stuff. However, emotional intelligence, I think companies need to focus on that. Because not only having the knowledge, you need to know how to react in a situation, innovation, or in a situation of, um, how to call it, when you need to act fast. So that's the thing that I think companies need to focus on that emotional intelligence, how to react and how to manage that kind of things. No, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, um, <coughs> and emotional intelligence has become a really big issue these days. I mean, uh, much more important. I mean, we, we, we all know about IQ, about in intelligence quotient, but emotional intelligence, how you, how you uh, is really much more about application, about how you apply things. And it's a really important issue. Um, I'm very conscious, by the way, that I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, we have a, but we, we certainly have time for another couple of questions. And then I just have a two minute thing to, uh, 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 to wrap up with. Any more, any more comments, any more questions? Thank you. Um, I'm Jenny Pesolano. I'm currently a technical project manager and I work in an agile environment. Um, and so I basically work with the same team constantly. Um, and we're working on a lot of different projects um, at the same time. And one of the things that I've tried doing recently is um, in helping me see my team as human beings that are like valuable human beings, I also sort of am trying to see myself in the same way. Um, and I'll often check in with the team of how I'm doing with my soft skills. Um, how are they feeling? Are they feeling validated by me? Am I listening to them? Um, am I communicating appropriately on their behalf? Um, and they give me honest feedback, I feel like. Um, I've gotten some things that I need to work on, and I've been told um, some of the things that I'm good at. Um, and so I see the team really as a mirror for me of how I'm doing um, in this area. And then I also see the other PMs in my organization as well. Um, I think that's been helpful for me to gain some of that some of that knowledge and experience of going to maybe some of the more senior PMs and being like, have you worked with this dude before? <laughs> like, is it me? <laughs> um, like, what works for you? Because um, I think there's, uh, at, least, at least for me in the beginning, there was this idea that I had to sort of keep doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and finally, uh, with enough times of, of getting the same results that weren't positive, I started asking the people I was working with and then also the, the other members of my organization. Um, and that's been very helpful, and it's helped create a dialogue um, in our organization about emotional intelligence and empathy um, and respect and communication that really wasn't there before. Well, I actually think it's very refreshing and brave that you ask for personal feedback, yeah. and I think more of us should do it more often. <laughs> Sorry, there are a couple of questions here. I'm curious. Um, if you have any methods that you will coach project managers on to recognize the type of behavior that we should um, use as a project manager to fit the needs of those people that we're working with. So how do we identify the way that we should adjust as a project manager? <sighs> now go on. How do you do that in the city? <laughs> how do academics do that? <laughs> would like to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to remember what class this was. Um, motivation? Maybe yours? Yeah. So one thing that I learned through um, the BU program was a way that, and I've started to use that a little bit, is try to understand my uh, the people of the project team or direct reports, 
what their motivations are, how they're motivated, and that's helped me to cater my emotional intelligence towards them, where it's gonna fit for them, because it certainly doesn't work. Everyone's motivated completely differently. So it, you can't do a broad spectrum, but I've found by trying to understand who they are, so there's the empathy um, and respect, but also understanding what motivates them, I've been able to apply some of the emotional intelligence skills that way, and that's actually been somewhat successful. And I think that some people are, are motivated by intrinsic things like like money. <laughs> and some people are motivated more by extrinsic things. Those of us who work in the university system uh, tend to be more motivated by, you know, intellectual freedom. We're certainly not motivated by money because we're, you know, we, we could probably all earn money, uh, better money elsewhere. But, but, we, but we love what we do and, and we have the freedom to do it, you know, in, in, a, in the way that we want. And I think that that's really, um, it, it's really it's really important to try to find out what people's hot buttons are. You know, you know wh what gets them going, um, and and that comes down to empathy and emotional intelligence and putting yourself in the place of the person and, and trying to see things from their from their perspective. But it can be challenging. Um, how do you find? Or I guess, what differences do you find, if any, with developing soft skills when the teams you're working with, the, the projects you're developing and managing, are with teams at other companies? A lot of what we talked about seems to be well, I think you're working with those people directly in person. Yeah, I think that it's, uh, it comes down to culture again. You know, if, the, if, the, if those companies are c culturally dramatically different, it can be incredibly challenging because... Um, because the way that people work within within organisations, you know, that, that that are very flexible and create space for people to do things differently, compared to very hierarchical companies, it can be dramatically different. And there are some real complicated bridges to to build, you know, when you're trying to do that. The other thing which we've not touched on, of course, is virtual teams. You know, the fact that you know some you know often we're working with people who we never meet. You know who who were who were you know the other side of the world who we meet through a computer screen you know and through Skype or through Adobe Connect or through Webex or or whatever and there's a whole bunch of of additional challenges around there. Do um, you have suggestions for developing the soft skills for the, those virtual situations? We are building more and more of that into the BU program as we, as, as we're redeveloping it. Um, but it is complicated. And I know there's another question here. Just on the emotional intelligence, um, I've been in project management 35 years, and that emotional intelligence tool is, the, to me, the most important. And I was explaining to uh, up here yesterday that everybody's dynamic, everybody's emotions are in dynamic situation. And even during an engagement in a meeting, a person's emotions are going to change. And you have to constantly be in a mode of feedback, even subconsciously in a meeting or an interaction, to watch for these changes and watch for the feedback. The empathy comes naturally if you're emotionally intelligent. I mean, they go hand in hand. They don't exist without each other. But being smart enough to take yourself away from the fact that you have a schedule, the fact that you have a budget, and getting yourself focused on how important the performance and the feeling of your team is relative to everything else and keep yourself focused on that. And that, to me, on the personal side, is the best tool I've learned over the and years. And it comes back to the fact that, that people, people are the, it's people that deliver. You provide them the environment as yeah. a project and manager. You, you yeah. don't do the work for them. Yeah, if you provide them with the environment, then great. Um, I'm sorry, did you just want to wrap up with something, Alice, or? Uh, or? The scientific, uh, scientific Mind, uh, which is a branch of Scientific uh, Magazine, uh, they had an article in the previous issue on how complex communication is. I'm just following up on the point that uh, even in a meeting, things change. Uh, but they, you know, they, just, they had a major research on uh, just one single component, how long it takes before you respond. And the example they gave is, let's say you want to borrow a bike from someone, your friend. So you, you, if your question is, can I borrow your bike? The, if you give the response back in one second, whether it's yes or no, means one thing. Two seconds means something else. 
Three seconds later, if you say yes, it means something else. Five seconds means something else. And for goodness sake, if you send it by email and don't get the response for, you know, within the next two hours or three hours, whatever your friend is expecting, it may mean something else. And if you, if the, if you never got that email and never replied, your friend is probably thinking you're no longer my friend. So it, it was just how complex communication is. It's just, uh, you know, just a one second, two seconds, three seconds uh, while you're talking and, and responding to a yes, no, I agree, don't agree. It is just, uh, it's, it's pretty complex. Uh, no, no wonder the next important thing we teach about is managing conflict. Mm. <laughs> okay, I just want to finish with one minute um, about competencies within changing organizations. We've talked quite a lot about competencies in hard skills, in soft skills, etc. Organizations are changing. Historically, typical organizations used to be silo-based. So there was a job requirement and you employed candidates with the skills, the abilities and talents to work within that particular silo, to work within accounting, to work within finance, to work within operations, to work within research and development, whatever it happened to be. These days, we're moving much more towards organizations where these silos are overlapping. And that means that um, the transferable skills are becoming more and more important. So with overlapping roles in the organization, you know, the, the, the soft skills that you can take with you from role to role have become more important. But the organizations that we're developing now and the organizations maybe of the future are looking much more like this, where there's an organization and then there are lots and lots of overlapping different um, elements, some of which are involving um, um, customers, some of which are involving suppliers, some of which are involving partners, um, and actually multi-skilled project managers are actually really well equipped to working in this type of organization because they're embracing lots and lots of different disciplines you know as they're working through projects and i just think that that's a really you know important thing to finish on so thank you very much and thank you for your questions and for your interest